I know one of the previous authors showed this, but uh, the definition of pain, and there are a couple of things to keep in mind when we think about pain. Uh, first of all, that the definition that, that kind of the international community has agreed on is that there's a sensory and emotional component to the experience of pain. And that emotional component, and I also will be talking a little bit about some of the cognitive attentional factors that we study. They turn out to, they turn out to be um, very important, especially as we start st um, kind of trying to think about the clinical management of people with pain states. These are some interesting data that were collected a long time ago in the early days of imaging. And what I like about these data is that the methodology, what they, what, this is a study by Bob Coghill. And what he did was he, he took people, he brought them into the laboratory, and this is an fMRI study, so they're healthy people who don't have persistent pain conditions. He brings them in and he puts a, a 49 degree stimulus on, on, often it's on the forearm or the arm. And um, what you see here is that in response, the pain rating that people give in response to a 49 degree stimulus varies a lot across people. And so in the clinical world, we're always thinking that, um, or we often are thinking that the variability that we see in pain is due to the underlying pathophysiology. And what this slide, series of slides is going to show you is that the variability that we see in pain is due to our individual differences in our processing of pain. And so it's not just the pathological process of the disease state that varies across people, but it's also our, our kind of inborn and learned ability to deal with pain that's very important. And so what you see here is that these are the people who report low pain. And so there's a group of people who report to this 49 degree stimulus anywhere from one to three. There's another group who are the high sensitivity group, and they, to that same stimulus, report six, seven, eight, nine. And so it nicely shows that the variability, and then when you look at their brains while they're experiencing this same degree of stimulation, you see that the two groups, the low sensitivity group, shows less activation in some key brain areas than the high sensitivity group. And some of these, er these areas are the areas that are involved in emotions and attentional processing of, of sensory stimulation. So the anterior cingulate cortex, the prefrontal cortex, other areas have also been identified. So what I thought I'd do today in, um, in the time that I have is talk to you about some of the psychological factors that have been really well researched. And the first two, anxiety and depression, have been well researched, as has pain catastrophizing. It's something I've spent a lot of time thinking about. Sleep disturbance is something that's now just being studied in a very systematic way in the pain community. Then, as I said, I'll talk a little bit about treatment. Um, when we talk about um, negative affect, um, that we, there, there's a lot of work that's been done in the pain field. And I think this slide nicely demonstrates the complexity of the conceptualization and experience of negative affect when people have pain. So there's the, the concept of general distress, and that's, that's feeling anxious, feeling depressed, feeling distressed, and people bring those kinds of emotions to their experience of pain. We also study in this kind of constellation of ne negative affective responses to pain, the fact that, that pain becomes cognitively intrusive. And I'll talk a little bit about that when I talk about catastrophizing. And we also study something called pain-related anxiety that people differ in. And then finally, the third component of negative affect is the fear of pain. I'm not going to talk so much about this today, but this is particularly relevant with people who have activity-related pain, like low back pain. And certain people who have elevated levels of fear of pain will then start to restrict their activities that cause pain, and they become more and more constrained in what they do. And that becomes part of the, kind of the, the chronicity and persistence of their pain syndrome. So let me talk a little bit about the kind of what happens when we, we're talking about pain is that most people come to the experience of pain, especially in their clinical care, with some historical experiences of pain, uh, especially in adults. You'll be hearing about kids later on. And, um, and definitely, when somebody has a persistent pain condition, they've had some sort of acute pain condition. So a lot of what we do in this literature is we try to study the various parts of the trajectory as people go from acute to chronic pain. And this, I'll just tell you, the literature is a mess. We're, ta we're talking about studies with human people, human beings, and clinical populations. So there's lots of different things going on, lots of moving parts. Um, but there's a real convergence of some of these factors over lots of different studies. One of them is that um, anxiety and depressive symptoms. And when I talk about anxiety and depression in this lecture, um, really what I'm talking about are symptom checklists. We're not talking about the clinical diagnoses of anxiety and depression. That's a whole different category of discussion. So we're talking about people who are elevated on anxiety and depression, and when they go in for surgery or when they have an acute 
illness with, that's associated with a high level of pain, they have more pain. And that's been repeatedly shown in lots of different studies. And there are lots of, uh, there, there are a number of different factors that are associated with who has more pain at an injury, but anxiety and depression is one of them. And in fact, um, if, when pe if people don't have much anxiety and pain, they may be kind of more likely to come out of an acute episode pain-free. But we know that when people have anxiety and depression, they not only have elevated acute pain, but they also are at risk for persistent pain. And so there's a very nice study that was done in um, total knee replacement that demonstrated that levels of anxiety and depression before surgery and this is, this is um, um, a total knee replacement where what essentially is happening is the, the painful knee, the joint, is being replaced. So theoretically, um, uh, that's a cure. Now, there are also kind of um, side effects for surgery in terms of um, neuropathic pain and other kinds of problems that come from the site of the injury and the scar tissue. Uh, but, but what we see in this study is that anxiety and depression are good predictors, uh, a reasonable predictor of, of level of pain following this joint repair. And this is a year out. Now we can also kind of think about one of the things that in the, when we start to talk about persistent pain, chronic pain, we have to think about how people are functioning. Because pain, one of the, one of the costs to, to medicine and our healthcare system is that people who have persistent pain states often stop doing things that lead them to be productive citizens. So they might not work, or they might go part-time, they may be less engaged in their family and their ch with their children and, and um, both the immediate and extended family. They, do, they start to change their life to accommodate the difficulties that they're having. And um, one of the things that we, we also know is that these factors, these psychological factors, help us understand this trajectory. And so, for example, um, there are a couple of different studies that suggest that, that, that when people have acute pain and it becomes, it starts to endure over time, possibly because of anxiety and depression, but other factors, that that pain then leads to um, anxiety and depression and that that, in fact, contributes to poor function. And so these are some data that we, um, that Steve Wegener in, the, um, in physical medicine and rehab at, at um, Hopkins uh, analyzed, and this is a really interesting study that was a multi-center study of people who had experienced lower extremity trauma. And they were followed for many months, but these are data going from um, three months after their injury to a full year after their injury. And what, what we were doing in this analysis was we were trying to understand um, function a year after an injury. And you would expect that um, that pain early on would be a very good predictor of the function that people are uh, able to experience over long term. And these are con complicated st statistical analyses that control for lots of different things. And so function at one point in time is a very good predictor of function at another time. Pain at one time is a very good predictor of pain later. What was interesting about these analyses was, was we basically found that pain was not directly related to function. But what happens over time, and I think this tells a very nice story of some of the psychological aspects of, of living with pain, is that when you have pain, it disrupts your emotional kind of uh, state. And that that emotional state seems to, in part, contribute to the functional outcomes that we see in the clinic. So just to kind of briefly summarize, we see that anxiety and depression contribute to acute pain. We see that it contributes to persistent pain. And we see that persistent pain contributes to the experience of anxiety, which also then Im impacts on function. So it's kind of a complicated um, pathway, but not completely unexpected.